I'm Jeff, and this is my wife, Kathy. Um, to the right of my wife is my daughter-in-law, Charlotte, and to the third right is my son, Clayton. Uh, my son, Clayton, is my powerful son. He's just returned to the Lord here recently. Amen. We just, we just have to look face to face upon him since it all took place in the past hour and a half. So praise the Lord for that. Um, we, Jamal and I just finished two weeks ago a two week long prophecy school in London and while we were there we had the opportunity to speak 60 different presentations between the two of us 60 and 62 or something like that and while we were there we knew this was coming up and I suggested to Jamal um, rather than him select 10 subjects and I select 10 subjects why don't we just put together a, a series of 20 and just trade off back and forth that's what we did. So you, you have to forgive Jamal. He's working from my notes. In order to make it happen, one of us had to be the one to put the 20 subjects together because of time. So Jamal is working from my notes. He understands the material, but that always, in, you know, the speaker's used to his own notes. So, so that's part of what's going on here. Um, over the, I'm speaking quickly because I have an hour long presentation and I only really have to take about 10 minutes here in the beginning. So I'll make a quick focus on this short introduction. I've had the privilege um, of being involved with these prophecy schools for over a decade now, all around the world. So I am familiar with, with the dynamics of these meetings. They usually go for a little bit longer than this, usually not as long as two weeks like we had in London. Um, but one of the things that I would tell you to do right from the start <coughs> is as you have questions, there's going to be questions, write them down. Um, we intend to answer your questions in a, a systematic, organized fashion rather than taking them from the floor. It's too disruptive. Um, and plus, if, if you hand me off a, a question here this evening and I know that tomorrow I'm going to address that and I don't even have to take time for it, you, know, you, can, you can manage your time better if you're all written down. So, so do that um, and, and turn them into either Jamal or myself, and then when we have the time we're going to answer questions, we'll come together and do that. Um, <clears throat> these prophecy schools are based upon the last six verses of Daniel 11. We believe that the present truth message for Adventists in the day is the last six verses of Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. But um, these prophecy schools, we did probably 30 some of them outside the United States. In translated into different languages, and finally, in 2004, we decided we wanted to do one here in the United States for the purpose of recording it in English. Um, so, since 2004, we basically had one prophecy school a year in the United States at least. And if you keep going over Daniel 11:40 to 45, it gets really redundant, and it, we, because there's several faces here, probably 30 percent of face or more of the faces out there. I know that you've been in prophecy schools before. So what I'm saying is, the foundation of this prophetic material is this last six verses of Daniel 11, but we're not going to deal with those verses specifically here. But we have the materials to direct you to, to make a defense of those materials. This here is a magazine that is available. It covers the last six verses of Daniel 11. I've more than once been invited to give a sermon on the Sabbath and told people a basic overview of, of these verses, and then have someone take this magazine, and then while we're having potluck dinner after worship service, people have went out and read this magazine in an hour, an hour and a half, and come back for the afternoon meetings and have already went through it. It doesn't take this long if you're, if you're a typical administrator to get through. This is a basic overview of the last six verses of Daniel 11, and even though we're not going to specifically address these in the materials, you really have to know what those are as a point of reference because there's lines of prophecy and revelation that we're going to deal with that line up perfectly with those verses. And if you don't understand that connection, you're missing some of the strength of the argument. So I'm, what I'm telling you is that, unfortunately, this prophecy school is well down the line from 2004 where we set forth the basics. And uh, we have materials available when we've done those other prophecy schools that are available here in DVDs, if you haven't looked at them, um, we're going to encourage you to avail yourself of those. We're trying to sell anything, but um, probation's about to close. 
Um, we're convinced that this prophetic message that we're dealing with is that warning message to Adventism about the close of probation and that this information has been put together to help prepare us for that event that's just about to take place. Um, we believe that prophecy, we believe that, that since September 11, 2001, the Latin rain began to fall. And uh, we can demonstrate that and we can defend that from the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. And Seventh day Adventists haven't made a close study of what it means that the Latin rain is begin, beginning to fall, but once you begin to investigate that, it is clear that the Latin rain sprinkles upon Adventism for a while. The wheat and are still together and begin to sprinkle upon. Uh, the mixture of Adventism and then at the Sunday law, the church is purified and then the latter rain is poured out without measure. Um, that may be a new concept for some of you, but it's very sustainable um, within the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. Um, because of that, because of Zechariah 10, verse 1, where we're told, pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. Um, recently, we've been Specifically praying for the latter rain because we know that we're in the latter rain. If you read Zechariah 10, 1, let's start there. Just way off course for what we're studying here tonight. But you'll at least see my point on this subject. Zechariah 10, 1 says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. That statement requires, if you understand that statement the way it reads, you have to understand that you're in the time of the latter rain in order to ask for it. If you, can't, if you don't know that the latter rain is falling, you may ask for it, but it is an intelligent um, request. The Lord wants us to recognize that we're in that time period. And the re one reason I'm saying this, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I'm saying this is at this prophecy school here recently in London that went for the two weeks, um, we began to pray for the latter rain to be poured out. And in all the prophecy schools that I've been involved with, and, and I've probably been involved, I know I've been involved with more of these prophecy schools than, than anyone else, these type of prophecy schools, but I've never seen so much light um, arrive as in that prophecy school. It's just um, many, many things that we hope to share with you here, and I don't think we can even share all the things that that we recognize during that two weeks. and uh, But the point is, is we're expecting the Lord to continue to do that because we are in the time of the latter rain. And I know that that statement may challenge some of you, uh, but we will attempt to demonstrate that as we proceed. Um, not only do we need to know that we're in the time of the latter rain, it is a test, it is a requirement for some of the Adventists to recognize it when the latter rain is fall. That's why, if you remember in Testimonies and Ministers, page 300, a common statement, um, Sister Beck says, um, the latter rain will be falling on hearts all around them, but they will not receive or recognize it. There's a time when the latter rain begins to fall, and it's only those people that recognize that it's falling that receive it. And the tears <coughs> and advocacy don't receive it because they don't recognize it. They're required to recognize when the latter rain begins to fall. And uh, let me give you a very nice quote for that, and then we'll get started um, into our presentations. If you have the, the notes that Jamal and I are using, um, if you turn to page 114, if you're okay, but if you don't have them, you don't have them, we'll get them afterwards. Page 114, there's a quote that's found in Life Sketches. It's also found in the New and Herald. A review in Herald, July 5th, 1906, says this. Sister White is responding to a rumor that was going around that she said New York City was going to be destroyed by a tidal wave. And she had never said that. So that, that's how she starts the statement. She says, Now comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I have never said. I have said, as I looked at the great buildings going up there, story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then, the words of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, will be fulfilled. And that Revelation 18, verse 1 through 3, is the mighty angel that comes down and joins the third angel. And Seventh-day Adventists have always understood that when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins the third angel of Revelation 14, the latter rain begins to sprinkle. Okay. 
So she says, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arrive to shake terribly the earth? Then the words of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th of chapter, 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth. But I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York. Only I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. Uh, September 11, 2001, the great buildings in New York City were thrown down and the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in the latter end and was sprinkled on Adventism. If that was the only quote, the only reference we had to make that claim, then it would be a little bit presumptuous. It's not the only one. But with, in connection with all the other arguments, this is such a profound quote that's on here. When the great buildings of New York are thrown down, Revelation 18, verse 23 is fulfilled. And if you're familiar with Acts chapter 3, we're told to send our sins beforehand in the judgment that we might receive the refreshing. Right? The refreshing, since it quite clearly identifies as what? The latter rain. We were saying, according to Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and onward, our sins beforehand in the judgment in order for what? For them to be blotted out, that we might receive the refreshing. When the latter rain begins to sprinkle, it means you're in the time period when God's people are sending their sins into judgment and they're being blotted out. It means that you're in the judgment of the living. So what we're talking about here is never been a more serious message for mankind. Um, I hate to do this, but I need to do this. I probably forgot some of what I wanted to do in the preliminary ones, but We've already had two opening prayers, but before we get into the future, let's have one more prayer. I was just giving you an overview of the prophecy story. Yes. Holy Father, we ask that you would bless us with your presence, through your angels, and that you would pour out your spirit and his latter rain power upon this meeting and this, the meetings that take place this entire week. We know that when we are involved in efforts like these and meetings like these, that Satan's on the ground to distract and uh, bring in fanaticism and confusion. We ask that you uh, bind him, that you keep those influences away from us. And we ask that you bring conviction on each and every heart and our personal need to prepare for what's about to take place, that we might be among those that uh, are privileged with the, with the responsibility to glorify your name in this point. Most of you don't have the, the notes. Um, we'll get them more early before the scene is over. The title of this first presentation is the banner, the banner of the Third Angel's Message. And I'm going to start with the passage from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 114. Since this prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line, the more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly we shall understand prophecy, the prophecy of Daniel, for the revelation is a supplement of Daniel. The more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God, the deeper and surer, sure, even as the eternal throne will appear the truths of ancient prophecy. We shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit's utterances through the prophets. These messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies, but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. Now I know that we're at different levels of understanding of, in, of the message of Adventism in here. Um, but when Sister Wright here in this quote talks about the banner of the third angel's message, typically in Adventism, when we think about the three angels of Revelation 14, uh, we think about the first angel being the everlasting gospel who fear God, give him glory for the hour of the judgment has come. The second angel is Babylon, is fallen, the third angel is the warning against receiving the mark of peace. So when we talk, someone says something about the banner of the third angel's message, we think the banner of the third angel's message has to do with the correct doctrinal understanding of what it means to fear God and to give glory to God. What does the hour of his judgment mean? What's it mean to come out of Babylon? And those are all truths. Right? I'm, not, I'm not arguing against those truths. 
Uh, the three angels' messages are also can be understood as historical fulfillments. Each of these, each of these messages arrived at a certain point in history, so you could address them as what, when they came into history in, in the entire time. But Sister White is here telling us that there is a way to use the three angels' message in order to bring to light the ancient truth of prophecy. So what, I, what we're going to suggest here is that within the banner of the three angels' message is a pattern that the Lord has identified that allows us to bring all the lines of prophecy together at the end of the world in a systematic fashion in order to bring life online and develop the true picture. That, that, that pattern that we're calling the banner of the three angels' message is a three-one pattern. Three angels' messages came into history in the middle right time period. The fourth angels' message comes into history at the end of the world. This is the banner of the third angels' message that allows us to, as Sister Wright says, um, the, the deeper and sure, deeper, even as the eternal throne will appear, the truths of ancient prophecy. There is a way that these messages um, allow us to understand the prophecies at the end of the world. The first four presentations by Jamal and I, four or five, are going to be dealing with this particular pattern. This is just the end to it. Um, <clears throat> in counsels, counsels to Writers and Editors, page 26, 27, it says, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message have been located by the word of inspiration. Not a pay or pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. Where the first, second, and third angels' message arrived in history is being emphasized here. We have to be clear about when the first angels' message arrives, when the second angels' message arrives, where they're located. And she, this isn't the only place where she emphasizes this. She says things like, there can't be a third, God, a first, and a second, and... Um, but all I want you to see here is that these messages have a location. And we're going to put those, we're going to deal with the location as we proceed. And select the messages, book 2, page 104. <clears throat> it says the first and second angels' messages were given in 1843 and 1844, and we're now under the proclamation of the third. But all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for the truth. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation. Now, that should be going to tell us what we're supposed to do by pen and voice concerning these three messages. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation, showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without a first and a second. These messages are to be give, given to the world in publications. In discourses, now notice what she says here in this last part. These messages we are to give to the world in publications, in discourses, showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. There is some way that we can identify the location of when the first, second, and third angels' message arrived in history and use that information to identify what takes place at the end of the world show what has been in the right history of what will be us. But she is teaching Publishing Ministry, page 175. Again and again, I've been shown that the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we've been treated a last year's almanac. The record is to be kept in mind, for history will repeat itself. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people in Adventism that don't really believe the history will repeat itself. Um, there's one brother that poses this idea, and, and he's um, arguing with me about this idea. And, and I took him first to 1 Corinthians 10 11, and all these things happen. He's an example for those that are living at the end of the world. And he says, Well, I agree with 1 Corinthians 10 11, but all those examples of the Old Testament, they're not telling us what history will take place at the end of the world. They're telling us. They're providing us moral lessons that we need to understand as we stand in the end of the world. And this brother is a representative of many brothers in Adventism. This brother is a, has an influence on Adventism. Um, he works at a self-supporting college near where we are. And we came to Portland on Friday. And we talked to our family back in Arkansas on Sabbath. We church on Sabbath. This brother 
in Sabbath school, a friend of ours was talking about this chart here. And this brother that doesn't believe history was repeated, he, he raised his hand and challenged him and says, this chart here, it's just full of errors. There's, we have no, we, we can't have any confidence in this chart. Um, this chart is what allows us to nail down where the first, second, and third angel's message come into history, like Sister White is talking about here, in order that we can illustrate the things that have been and the things that will be. And I'm saying that because when we look at this material, particularly when you start considering the material in the latter rain time period. One of the truths about the latter rain that inspiration has worked very carefully and diligently to inform God's people about is when it comes to the time of the latter rain, there is opposition that is raised against that message. That's one of the reasons 1888 is in the record books, is because in 1888 the Lord tried to pour out the latter rain, and when it happened, Almost the majority, or almost all of the church, warred against that message. That's sacred history. It's telling us that when the Lord finally does get to the point where he's going to pour out the latter rain, but one of the things that we need to be aware of is that the message connected with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to be fought against within Ephesus. That's part of the story. It has to be factored in if you're going to understand the latter rain. Correctly. Great Controversy, page 243, is one of the most, um, one of the quotes that is the point of reference, probably more than any other than for the least first four or five presentations here this week. It says, The work of God in the earth presents, from age to age, a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for all the time. Every reform movement in sacred history is the same. And when you go through and you look at these reform movements, you will find that they all possess the same characteristics as one another. And when you bring them together line upon line, what you're illustrating is the final reform movement that takes place when the 144,000 are raised up during the time of the latter rain. And these reform movements are designed to illustrate that time period, that event for us, that we will receive that light. Education, page 191. And for those of you that plan on getting uh, the syllabus, and I, I know some of you are writing down all these references, if you're going to get a syllabus, you don't need to write it down because they're in the syllabus. I'm just going through them. Um, the Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the world, word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and the work of redemption. He should learn the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. There's some of us in Adventism today that believe that all we need is the right experience, the right relationship with the Lord, and we don't have to understand the prophetic history and the prophetic record, but that is not in agreement with what we've been told. We are to learn to trace um, the whole story of the great controversy that has been revealed in God's Word and in history. In order to understand <clears throat> what takes place at the end, because Christ is the God that illustrates the end from the beginning. <coughs> Selective Messages, Book 2, page 101, gives a very nice definition for prophecy. She's speaking about how the Millerites taught prophecy in this passage, and she says, Historical events were set before, historical events showing the direct fulfillment of prophecy were set before the people. And prophecy, and the prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. <clears throat> she says historical events were set before the people and identified as the fulfillment of prophecy. I'll give you an example of a historical event that was a fulfillment of prophecy. The destruction of Jerusalem is prophesied in Daniel 9.26. The prince that shall come shall destroy the city, okay, AD 70, a historical event, fulfilled that prophecy. And it was said before the people, and it was shown to be a figurative delineation. And this word delineation in the 
the Webster's Dictionary of Ellen White's day and age, delineation means to set forth upon a line. And she says, it was a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. So prophecy is illustrated by a line going down to the end of the world. This is the end of the world. And the fulfillment of prophecy is illustrated by historical events. I'll give you another one. Papacy's Deadly Woman, 1798. But she says prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events. And the word figurative is identifying that these are not only historical events, but they are prefiguring other historical events. And we know that in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed, but Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, is also illustrating the time period of the seven last plagues. It was a historical event that fulfilled the prophecy, but it was a figurative fulfillment because it was prefiguring an event at the end of the world. 1798, the fall of the papacy was figured in, was prefiguring the final fall of the papacy at the end of the world. Prophecy is illustrated by historical events on a timeline going down to the end of the world. And a common word that we will co opt from Sister White that she uses for these events is waymarks. And when Sister White uses the word waymarks for these historical events, for these prophetic events, the Webster's Dictionary of her day and age defines waymarks as marks along the way. So these are marks along the way to the end of the world, the waymarks. Um, in Review and Herald, July 31st, 1888, it says, We must have a knowledge of the scriptures that we may trace down the lines of prophecy. And what I'm emphasizing here is the lines of prophecy. And the reason that I'm saying lines of prophecy is because we're going to identify that the way that the rabbi and message is taught is by reading line upon line. That's from Isaiah 28. We're going to get there this evening on this presentation. Uh, but prophecy is a prophetic line. And we're to bring the different lines of prophecy together line upon line. So when Sister White says, we must have a knowledge of the scriptures, that we may trace down the lines of prophecy and understand the specifications given by the prophets and by Christ and the apostles that we may not be ignorant but able to see that the day is approaching so that with increased zeal and effort we may exhort one another to faithfulness, piety, and holiness. And we're going to attempt to do that here for us this week. We're going to identify the specifications that are in these prophetic lines and we're going to bring these lines together line upon line. And when we bring them together line upon line, and then we identify that this, these reform movements are now repeating here at the end of the world, and this is the reform movement of the 144,000. When you're confronted with that argument from the Bible, then, it, then you have the ability to exhort each other to holiness and to zeal, because you realize that you are in the final reform movement. And that this is genuinely taking, genuinely taking place in front of your very eyes. Of course, you have the, the witness of what's going on in the world. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilences, the weather's out of control. Um, but we need to understand these things from God's prophetic word of church. Acts of the Apostles, page 585. It says, in the Revelation, all the books of, of the Bible meet in the end. When we bring these lines of prophecy together, the point of reference for end time Bible prophecy is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is what you bring these lines upon to bring them together. It's the book that is the primary focus of illustrating the end of the world. And God's all sister God says all the things to be in the book of Revelation. Manuscript releases volume 9, page 7 and 8 says, Revelation is a sealed book, but it is also an open book. It records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. The teachings of this book are definite, not mystical, and unintelligible. In it, in the book of Revelation, in it, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. So the same line of prophecy that's in Revelation is in the book of Daniel. One of the arguments, one of the arguments that has persisted for years 
on what we teach about the last six verses of Daniel 11 is verse 41. Verse 41 of Daniel 11, the glorious land is the United States. But the General Conference brethren, the Biblical Research Institute, and the majority of self-supporting ministries in Adventism believe that the glorious land in verse 41 is the Seventh-day Adventist church. They're wrong. The glorious land is the United States of America. Amen. There are many arguments for that, but one of the arguments is, if you believe that the glorious land in verse 41 of Daniel 11 is the Seventh-day Adventist church, it's at that point in verse 41 when the king of the north, the papacy, is conquering the Seventh-day Adventist church. Or if you believe the glorious land is the United States of America, that it's in verse 41 of Daniel 11 that the papacy is conquering the United States. It's a Sunday law. That's what's being described. The argument isn't over, over whether the king of the north is the papacy. Everyone accepts the idea that the king of the north is the papacy. So it's whether in verse 41... You believe that the papacy is conquering the Seventh-day Adventist Church just before probation closes, because in four verses, Michael stands up when the probation closes. Or whether you think the papacy is conquering the United States at the Sunday Law just before probation closes. And one of your strongest arguments is if you believe that the glorious land in verse 41 is the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Sister White tells us, in the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in the book of Daniel. So if you think the papacy conquers the Seventh-day Adventist Church just before probation closes, please show that to me in the book of Revelation. It's not there. Of course, in Revelation 13 and 11, the papacy is conquering the United States. The United States speaks as a graph. It is there. Where was that last book from? The same line? Um, that's Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 7, page 8, the syllabus. You'll have it there. Okay. Um, in prophecy schools, if you're if you're not familiar with the material that we teach, I would try to twist your arm to, to purchase the 2004 prophecy school. That's where all the basics are put forth. We haven't we're not covering the basics there. Some of the rules that we will refer to a great deal in the overview of Daniel 11. <coughs> but one of those rules that is dwelt upon a great deal. Is that all prophets are speaking about the end of the world? And they're all telling the same story. You can go through the Bible and you can show that. Um, you know, First Corinthians fourteen thirty two says the spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. And the next verse, verse thirty three says, for God is not the author of confusion. All the all the prophets are telling the same story. You're not going to be telling different stories. And First Corinthians uh, ten eleven. All these things in the Bible are examples of the end of the world. Okay? And on and on and on, you can bring an argument together from the Bible that the whole Bible is an illustration of testimony about the end of the world, and all the prophets are giving testimony primarily about the end of the world, secondarily to the days in which they lived. Okay, so we're not, we're not establishing that, that, that in this presentation. We've done that in past presentations, but if you would go now with me to Isaiah 28, <clears throat> understanding that Isaiah is one of the prophets and that he is speaking about the end of the world, in Isaiah 28, verse 1, it says, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. So you have to ask yourself, there's a woe pronounced here on the drunkards of Ephraim, and you're a student of prophecy, and Sister White says we're all called to be students of prophecy. Every Seventh-day Adventist is required to be a student of prophecy. She says so in black and white more than once. The student of prophecy has to understand who are the drunkards of Ephraim, and it's easy to, to figure that one out, because all you have to go to is verse 14. It says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. The drunkards of, Jeru of Ephraim are the men that ruled Jerusalem. And in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 210, Sister White says, Jerusalem at the end of the world is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So Isaiah 28 is a woe pronounced upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the world. And I'm not dealing with that, and I'm not bashing the church. I'm just dealing with God's word. I want to make a point here that this is about that woe. 210. In verse 9 of Isaiah 28. Well, let, let's go on. Let, let me make one more point and then we'll come back to verse 9. 
Isaiah 28 and 29, that, that passage of Isaiah, it's the same passage. It's continuous. You read it closely. It's not a new thought in chapter 29. He's still dealing with the drunkards of Ephraim in chapter 29. Those scornful men that rule Jerusalem. And look at verse 9 of Isaiah 29. It says, Stay yourselves and wonder and cry out and cry. They are drunken. Okay, that's what it said in verse 1 of Isaiah 28. The drunkards of Ephraim. But not, they're drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of, of deep sleep, and hath closed your, closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers he hath covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of the book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Now, brothers and sisters of Seventh-day Adventists, what book is sealed? Daniel Revelation we see the books and the leadership of the Adventist church at the end of the world according to Isaiah 28 and 29 cannot understand the prophetic word at the end of the world that's their drunkenness okay and so once you see that this is the this is part of the woe that is pronounced against Adventism at the end of the world and this is not a new thing okay keep your finger in Isaiah um, 28 go to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 this is not a new thing, the pronouncement against the leadership of the Adventist Church, the end of the world. The leadership of God's people in every reform movement re responds the same way to the message of the hour. They always have. And in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, verse 9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything where it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old times, which was before us. The fact that there's a woe pronounced against the leadership of God's church at the end of the world is in agreement with it. In every point of history where the reform movement is illustrated, the men that were ordained to lead out in the work of reforms, for whatever reason, they end up fighting against it. Isaiah 28, 29, when we're applying it to Adventism at the end of the world, it's the same old story. But, at the end of the world, when Adventism cannot understand the book that's sealed, in verse 9, there's a question raised. Isaiah 28, verse 9. This is going to contrast the drunkards of Ephraim. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Now, brothers and sisters, Daniel 12 is an illustration of the end of the world. In Daniel 12, the book of Daniel is sealed up for time. Daniel won't go there because I don't have enough time to go there. But we're familiar with this generally as Seventh-day Adventists. So in Daniel 12, verses 3 and 4, Daniel is told to seal up his book until the time of the end. At the time of the end, his book is going to be unsealed. And what, what will happen when his book is unsealed? There will be an increase of knowledge. And if you read on through Daniel chapter 12, Based upon that knowledge, there's two classes of worshipers that are formed. In Daniel 12, it's called the wise and the wicked. And it says, the wise will understand the increase of knowledge, but the wicked will not understand the increase of knowledge. And in Hosea 4.6, and Hosea is a prophet, so he's speaking about the end of the world. In Hosea 4.6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So there's an increase of knowledge at the end of the world that tests God's people it produces two classes of worshipers. In Daniel 12, it's the wise and the wicked. In the parable of the ten virgins, it's the wise and the foolish. The weak and the care, the gold and the dross. But what produces those two classes is the increase of knowledge. So when you're in Isaiah 28, and it's talking about the time period when the leadership of God's church cannot understand the book that is sealed, verse 9 raises the question, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the melt and drawn from the breast, and you can easily go into Hebrews and show that um, the milk of God's word are the basic foundation of doctrines that every second day have and should understand but when they are baptized, that's the milk of God's word. Okay. So in verse 9, when it's saying, whom shall he teach knowledge? The end of the world, when this increase of knowledge comes to God's people, the people that are going to understand are the people that aren't still walking around, struggling with the milk of God's word. I mean, if you, if you 
are wrapped up in the believing of foolishness that's brought by Desmond Ford, thinking that you can sin until Jesus returns, you're not going to understand the present truth message. If you, any of those foolish winds of doctrine that have been blowing through Adventism for the last 50 years, if you haven't settled upon the basic foundational understanding of Adventism at this point in history, when the increase of knowledge comes, those sisters, you're probably going to get swept away. Nothing new under the sun. That's the way it is. Amen. The people that are going to understand the fine morning message in Adventism are going to be people that have already got off the rest. They're not drinking the milk of God's word any longer. And it goes on to say, for precept, verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. He was supposed to speak to the people, to the ordained leadership, but they're drunk. They don't understand the book that is sealed. And he, Isaiah is saying that he's going to speak to his people through a different group of people, ones with stammering tongues, have been trained in public speaking. Yeah. Is that anything new? Who did Jesus have to, to get to work with him? Fishermen. Fishermen, tax collectors. It's always the same. What about the Millerites? Did he use the, the famous preachers in the Millerite history, or did he use some farmers? Okay, it's always the same. <coughs> For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. I know this next verse is where we we're really trying to get to. This time slipping away. To whom he said, this is the rest, wherewith he may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. This is, that's verse 12. No, that's verse 12 of Isaiah 28. In the syllabus, this is all there for you. On the syllabus, page 4. Page 4. In the, in the context of this passage, what's being identified is at the end of the world, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, when a woe is being pronounced upon those that were supposed to be the ones that recognize the final warning message for God's people. There will be a group of people that will, God will use to speak to his people. They're the ones with the stammering lips, identifying that they aren't those that have been trained in the institutions on, on homiletics and all the things that you get trained with. But it's the time of the refreshing, and Sister White is clear what the refreshing is. What, the re what is the refreshing? The latter rain. But notice it says, they would not hear. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the latter rain, one of the things that is misunderstood in Adventism is in Adventism, we think the latter rain is the Holy Spirit power that comes upon us, and it gives us the power to speak in tongues and cast out demons and do miracles, and it's some type of power. I'm not denying that in the latter rain time period, the Holy Spirit will provide that type of power to human beings. But the latter rain is a message that comes from God's Word. Amen. And Adventism doesn't understand that it's a message, that it is the messages that are that come from His Word during this time period that is specifically the latter rain. Amen. And that's why this verse 12 is saying that when the refreshing comes, they would not hear. It's a message that they will not hear. It's something that comes from God's Word. Amen. We have more to say about that as we proceed. Yes, we have more to say about that as we proceed. Um, from Great Controversy 611, 612, it says, The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than mark its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are to be again are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign in its close, at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye. Therefore, be converted that your sins be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He shall send Jesus. Time to refreshing is the latter rain. Verse 12 of Isaiah 28 is talking about the latter rain message when it comes to God's people through the stammering tongues. And it's a message. Councils on Diets and Foods, page 33, says this The refreshing, or power of God, comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God did them, namely, cleansing themselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Only those who are perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. 
This is what I mean. In fact, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord is the de definition of the early rain. And in other places, Sister White says, only those that are receiving the early rain will receive the latter rain. So we're in serious times. If the latter rain is truly falling, we are in serious times. Never been a more serious time. Amen. I think it's a, a write it down. Go ahead. Perfecting the holiness in Proverbs 9 10 is understanding the holy, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Life from life teaches from precepts. He just brought out is this the latter rain refreshing? It's settling the ceiling of the Holy Spirit of promise is settling into the truth. Oh, Mark says, intellectual and spiritual so that we cannot, cannot do it. Um, early, in, in connection with, I'm passing over a little bit in your notes, you'll see that I've already referenced that the notes of, of God's word is found in Hebrews um, chapter 5, <coughs> verse 12, on through 6, 2. Paul tells us what the milk is, and those that are going to understand this increase of knowledge are going to be those that are weaned from the breast. They're not going to be drinking milk any longer. And this is one of the challenges of a prophecy school. Here at the end of the world, if we're really presenting truths that are connected with the latter rain message, we should be able to stand in front of God's people and share things that do not require going to over the basic premises of the sanctuary, of justification, of sanctification. God's people should understand these things at this point in time. Although we're all at different levels. Um, we're supposed to be off the milk of God's word. And Sister White says it this way, early writings, page 63, there are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. Amen. Um, we have touched on Daniel 12. And Hosea 4, 6. 1 Peter 1, 19 says this. <clears throat> we have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein do ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And generally that's where we stop with that passage. Let's read a couple more verses. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. All the prophets, including Peter, are speaking about the end of the world. In the time period when the latter rain message arrives to God's people, there are going to be false teachers who are going to have a vision that are teaching damnable heresies. That is part of the environment where this message arrives. Now, we, I looked at Isaiah 28 and 29 um, briefly. There's much to say about Isaiah 28, 29. Let me summarize it for you before I read this last rather long quote and bring this presentation to a close. Isaiah 28, 29 is pronouncing a woe on the leadership of Adventism because they can't understand the book of the seal. Let, let, me, let me go back. I've read it, but I have the time here. Verse 9 of Isaiah 29 says, Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with, with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of your sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of the book that is sealed, which men to deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Now there's two classes in Adventism that are here addressed. The first one here we just read. He says he can't understand the books of Daniel and Revelation because it is sealed. And he's the learned. This is, this is those that have been through our educational institution. This is the, those in the leadership of Adventism that don't understand Daniel and Revelation. And there are people in the leadership of Adventism that do understand these things we're doing. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not being blanket about this. I'm saying, in general, the pronouncement of the prophecies is, is that the leadership is blind. But notice the next verse. 
and the book is delivered to him that is not learned. That's that's the lay people, you, myself, and probably most of you, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. The, the trained leadership can't understand the prophetic word because it's sealed, and the laity can't understand the prophetic word because they'll only learn it from someone that is learned. They'll only receive it from the teachers, but the teachers can't teach it because it's sealed to them. That's the condition of Adventism at the end of the world. And then if you drop down, and you, I, I don't mean to be cutting off these verses, but I'm just making some points. All these verses are important. But if you drop down to verse 16, this is all chapter 28, right? I mean 29. 29. 29. It's 28 and 29 together. Same spot. Verse 16 and 29, as it's talking about this situation, it says, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as potter's clay. Brothers and sisters, the reason that Adventism does not understand the books of Daniel and Revelation as they should is because they turn something upside down. And they may not like to hear it, but it's easy to see what they turned upside down. It's right here on this chart. Pioneers of Adventism understood that the daily in the book of Daniel represented paganism, the satanic power, and today we teach that the daily represents Christ's sanctuary ministry, a godly power. We've turned it totally upside down. And when you identify the daily in the book of Daniel as Christ's sanctuary ministry, you destroy it. The 2300 year prophecy. Yeah. William Miller dealt with that in his day and age, and he showed that if you believe that this daily is the sanctuary ministry of Christ, you destroy the 2300 year prophecy. And yeah. his mathematical argument today is just as sound as it was when William Miller used it. Yeah. And the reason that you can't understand that in Revelation, if you do that, is because the primary symbol of pagan Rome and its work placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. In 538, the primary symbol of the work of paganism and pagan Rome in the book of Daniel is the daily. If you don't understand the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome when the papacy was placed upon the throne of the earth in 538, then you cannot understand the work that the United States is doing at the end of the world because pagan Rome is what illustrates the role of the United States at the end of the world as it places the papacy back on the throne. If you remove that symbol from the book of Daniel, then, then you really don't know what the United States is doing, and you'll, you'll end up fulfilling Isaiah 8, where Isaiah says, don't get in a confederacy with these people that say a confederacy, and you can show that confederacy in the United Nations, and Isaiah 8 is a warning, not, about, not to get involved with those people. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is most definitely involved with the United Nations today, is it not? Adra is operating through the United Nations. We've entered into that confederacy because we no longer understand the role of the United States and its connection with the United Nations because we've turned something totally upside down and in doing so, we've eliminated our ability to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation as we should in order to be able to identify the role of the United States and its connected influences and actions in end time Bible prophecy. And the book becomes sealed to us. Now, I'm closing here. From Battle Creek Letters, page 123. <clears throat> Sister White, in, when you get these notes, you see here, for those of you that don't have them right here, this paragraph here and this paragraph here is what I just read. She's quoting Isaiah 29, verse 9, <coughs> on down through verse. 16. She quotes those verses that we just dealt with. That the book is sealed to them, and that surely you're turning the things upside down shall be esteemed as potter's clay. And then she says this in this paragraph. It's page 6 of the syllabus. It's page 123 of the letter. After she quotes those verses, she says this. Every word of this will be fulfilled. There are those who do not humble their hearts before God and who will not walk uprightly. They hide their true purposes and keep in fellowship with the fallen angel who loveth and maketh a lie. The enemy puts spirits upon men whom he can use to deceive those who are partially in the dark. Some are becoming imbued with the darkness that prevails and are settling, setting the truth aside for error. The day pointed out by prophecy is come. 
Jesus Christ is not understood. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is to them a fable. At this stage of Earth's history, many act like drunken men. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry, they are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a deep sleep. A spiritual drunkenness is upon many who suppose they are the people who shall be exalted. Their religious faith is just as is represented in this scripture. Under its influence, they cannot walk straight. They make crooked paths in their course of action. One and another, they go to and fro. They are looked upon by the Lord with great pity. The way of truth they have not known. They are scientific schemers. And those who could and should have helped because of clear spiritual eyesight are themselves deceived and are sustaining an evil work. The development of these last days will soon become decided. When these spiritualistic deceptions are revealed to be what they really are, the secret working of evil spirits, those who have acted a part in them will become as men who have lost their mind. Wherefore, and then she quotes from Isaiah, put on down through several verses, and then she says, It is presented to me that in our experience we have been in our meeting this very condition of things. Men who have had great light and wonderful privileges have taken the word of leaders who think themselves wise, who have been greatly favored and blessed by the Lord, but who have taken themselves out of the hands of God and placed themselves in the ranks of the enemy. The world is to be flooded with specious fallacies. One human mind accepting these fallacies will work upon another on other human minds who have been turning the precious evidence of God's truth into a lie. These men will be deceived by fallen angels when they should have stood as faithful guardians, watching for souls as they that must give an account. They've laid down the weapons of their warfare and have given heed to seducing spirits that make of no effect the counsel of God and, and set aside his warning and reproofs and are positively on Satan's side, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrine of devils. We believe that what we're teaching in this prophecy school in the next four or five days is at least part of the message of the latter rain. And that message is going to be opposed in Adventism. And it's going to be opposed by men and women that should have come up to the help of the Lord and accepted and advanced and promoted the message. And if you're going to understand these truths, you need to understand that this is the environment where this message arrives. And you need to give due diligence that you don't believe anything that I say or anything that Jamal or Duane says. But you take what we say, like Sister White says, you lay your preconceived ideas aside at the door of investigation and you test it by the word of the Lord. And if it's sound, then stand with it. If it isn't, oppose it, reject it. But it's a time to quit trusting another human being because the warning has been that. Those human beings that were supposed to be our spiritual guides aren't lying and they are positively on the side of the devil. Heavenly Father, we thank you for <clears throat> opening up this prophecy school. We ask for your continued presence all the way to the end. We ask that the material that is shared would be for your glory, your honor, and be edifying to us. And I said before you the, um, the request that you would put a conviction on each of our hearts to test the things that we're hearing through prayer, through the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy, that we may not deceive our own human being. And that those things that we understand to be correct, that you give us the courage to stand upon them. And send the one down the line and ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.